There are not enough wonderful things to say about um, our moderator, Jim Krieger. Uh, if we had all afternoon, maybe I could get through some of them, but uh, we don't. Um, Jim is the chief of the chronic disease and injury prevention section at Public Health for Seattle and King County in Washington State, and also a clinical professor of medicine and health services and attending physician at the University of Washington. Jim is a nationally recognized expert in the development and evaluation of community-based chronic disease control and prevention programs. Jim currently leads Seattle and King County's Communities Putting Prevention to Work program, CPPW, and he's the founding chair of the Nacho Big Cities Chronic Disease Community of Practice and leads its Sugar Sweetened Beverage Work Group. Jim Krieger. Okay, thanks George for the, the nice introduction. And what a, what a wonderful day and a half it's been. I mean, I'm just thinking back on everything I've learned, all the new connections I've made, the great ideas that have been exchanged. And so I think um, I want to thank CSPI for pulling us all together for the first time so we can really start looking at what is going on in all the different pockets, all the different places, all the different organizations around the country, all focused on this problem of, sh of um, sugary drinks. So the purpose of today's panel, this, this morning's panel, is to bring together folks who've been doing work but looking at it from the perspective of what does this mean for carrying the work forward after this conference? So really what we'll do is we'll hear about some very exciting and interesting work that each of the panelists have done, and then we'll move into a panel discussion where I'll be asking some questions about how do we carry the work forward and what are some of the implications of this? And then um, we'll open it up for everybody in the room to join in that same dialogue. And that will then segue into to Mike's um, closing comments about the way forward. So that's where we're headed in the next hour and a half or so. I'd like to introduce the panelists now, and then um, so you get a sense of who we have. We've got a great panel. Um, the first speaker will be Jean Kilborn, and she's well known for her work in brown images of women in advertising, studies of alcohol and tobacco advertising, and the impact this has on women. She's been featured as um, in many in some movies. She's written numerous books on the topic, and so we're really lucky to have her here today. Next will be followed by Lori Dorfman, and Lori is known to many of you as the director of the Berkeley Media Studies Group, and she's been a great ally and advocate and asset to us to, to look at issues of media advocacy and how best to get our message out in effective ways to, to move the work forward. And then we have um, Lynn Silver, and Lynn is a physician. Um, she's currently the health officer for Sonoma County in California, which is a relatively new job for her. We, many of us know her from her immediately preceding job where she was both um, assistant commissioner for chronic disease and also director of the Office of Science and Policy at the New York City Health Department and really was one of the leading forces behind many of the innovative uh, activities that New York City has been leading the nation, including menu labeling, trans fat, and so on. Um, so that's our, and then we have Jonathan Schenken, and Jonathan is a pediatric dentist in Maine. He's also on the faculty at the BU School of Dental Medicine, and has been very active in nutrition and dental health issues, working with the Institute of Medicine, with the Maine legislature, and other bodies to, to put forward an activist agenda around oral health and nutrition. So this is a, a really diverse and interesting bunch of folks we get to hear from, and so without further ado, I will turn it over to Jean. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. An honor to be with all these distinguished panelists and to be with all of you. I've been here for the conference the entire time and I've had really enjoyed it a great deal. I first met Mike and George way back in 1981. And at that time, I'd spent several years already studying the image of women in advertising and looking at alcohol and tobacco advertising. And in those days, no one thought this was, these were serious issues, and I had to convince people that they were, and I was working totally alone. So when I met Mike and George, they were my first colleagues, and it was so exciting to meet people who were as crazy as I was and looking at these issues in this particular way. I've been asked to do about a 10 to 12 minute overview of how Coca-Cola 
has positioned itself in our culture, in our society, and in some, to some extent in our hearts. And I'm going to focus on Coke because it's, of course, so far ahead of all the other sugary drinks in terms of marketing and all of that, although I will use uh, at least one Pepsi ad as well. If you feel later on that you'd like to get uh, some further information, this is my website. I have an extensive resource list, my email address, all kinds of further information. Now, most advertising, as we all know, exploits our very real and human needs and desires. Our desires to, to love and be loved, to be respected, to have meaningful work. Advertisers of most products yoke these desires and these needs with the products and encourage us to believe that buying and consuming these products will somehow meet these needs, which of course it never can. The marketers of Coke have long been masters at this, and Todd's presentation yesterday certainly illustrated that extraordinarily well. And when he talked about how important accessibility is, that they need to reach our hearts, and as he said, connect with me emotionally and I'll be yours forever. And that, of course, is the, the purpose. And as he also said, Coca-Cola cannot use a rational approach because there is nothing rational that they can say about their product that would encourage us to use it. In fact, just the opposite. So Coke has done an incredible job of getting people to conflate their product with emotions that can't really possibly be associated with a sugary, sugary carbonated beverage. And the product cannot deliver what it promises. I mean, we know this in a way, and yet we're so surrounded by these kinds of messages. Now, this commercial, for example, offers you the choice to be someone new. Hello, Hello. So I can be someone new. Now, in recent years, marketers have taken this strategy much further. It's not so much anymore that the product will lead us to happiness or will lead us to a romance or a friendship. It will be the lover. It will be the friend. It will be the source of happiness itself. In my book, Can't Buy My Love, my first book, I wrote about the way that advertisers increasingly encourage us to feel that we're in a relationship with products, to commit to a brand, the loyalty is to a brand, and to feel passion for our products rather than our partners. Now, the advertisers of all, most products do this, but the advertisers of addictive products are particularly sinister because the truth is addicts do feel in a relationship with the product, with the substance. There's a whole lot of loneliness at the heart of most addiction and the product becomes the lover, the friend. And they play upon this in ad after ad after ad. A, a Pepsi commercial is actually exemplifies this. I've been looking for you all night. Thank you. Thousands of examples of this, particularly in food advertising. A document from Coca-Cola itself entitled Coca-Cola Happiness Machine says, the key driver of happiness globally is human connection. Happy people are connected and human connex connections make us happier. This is completely true, but it has absolutely nothing to do with Coca-Cola, nothing. But the aim of the marketer is to make us believe that it does, to replace human connection with connection to a product and to make that seem like authentic connection. And this hijacking of our emotions, particularly in childhood, is as sinister as sugar, but that's not the focus of this particular presentation. Now, I wrote my book before social media existed. Social media, of course, make it infinitely easier for marketers to promise relationships with their products. Coke has 41 million followers on Facebook. 41 million. I think it's second only to Obama and Lady Gaga. Uh, Coke is also a major player in conversations on Twitter and other social sites such as Pinterest and the social, social music site Spotify. You can buy a Coke and get a free song from iTunes, etc. There are countless apps. Now to see how the world has changed, here's just a few seconds of a famous Coke commercial from 1970. And here's the current version. Coca-Cola once taught the world to sing in perfect harmony. It's time we all sing a new song, and this time you get to participate and help Jason Derulo create it. 
Unlock everything you need to know at AmericanIdol.com and be sure to watch the American Idol finale on Fox to see the hit song perform live. The product placement on American Idol could be a whole other presentation. As one marketer said, the future of branding now comes down to experiences more than ever. But these are faux experiences. These are not authentic experiences. In 2010, Coke launched the Where Will Happiness Strike Next campaign with the following online film. <laughs> In a short time, this film became one of the most successful online films the company had ever released. Today, customers can find happiness in every region of the world across 40 markets and through 100 plus versions of videos from the Where Will Happiness Strike Next campaign. According to company literature, this campaign captures the essence of the Coca-Cola company in which customers form bonding friendships and the brand delivers true moments of inspiration and happiness. Except, of course, they don't, and it doesn't. But that's what they say. Coke's marketing is worldwide, of course, and here are some excerpts from some campaigns in different countries, from Singapore. and Africa. show a very brief clip about Coke's upcoming strategy. And in this video, the person responsible for leading global creative vision and strategy for Coke explains how Coke will use the new media landscape to, quote, earn a disproportionate share of popular culture, end quote. The purpose of content excellence is to create ideas so contagious they cannot be controlled. We call this liquid. And these ideas are so innately relevant to our business objectives our brands and consumer interests, we call this linked. And through the stories we tell, we will provoke conversations and earn a disproportionate share of popular culture. The conversation model we have developed begins with brand stories. These brand stories create liquid and linked ideas. These liquid and linked ideas provoke conversations then we need to act and react to those conversations 365 days a year. Chapter 2. The Case for Change So what is the case for change? We have three key drivers. First, we intend to double the size of our business. That's a lot of incremental servings. The second... So, double the size of our business, incremental servings, as Todd talked about yesterday, per capita consumption is what it's about. And of course, that also means increased obesity, increased diabetes. There's no getting around that. Their marketing is brilliant. There's no question about it. In addition to all of this, they do great PR. Here's an ex just an excerpt from one of their campaigns. Coca-Cola and Participation teamed up to create Sogo Active, which is a program to get youth up and active. 
the grants from Coca-Cola Canada provide opportunities for communities to have access to creating youth-centered programs. Now, with all of the junk food and the junk drink PR stuff, when they talk about you know prevention, that sort of thing, they only emphasize physical activity, of course, never diet or anything like that. So needless to say, we have our work cut out for us. In order to fight back effectively, I agree with what Todd said yesterday, that we need to be equally emotional. We need to fight for people's hearts, not just their minds. We need to reframe the issues and the message. We need to use media literacy and counter advertising, of course, but we also need many other strategies, and the other panelists will be talking about that. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jean. Okay, next up is Laurie Dorfman. That was amazing, wasn't it? Man, you know, I've, I've been so inspired through this whole meeting, and now I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. Okay, so, um, so now uh, I'm glad, though, Jean, that that Jean gave us the overview of what this marketing is about because in fact, I think that has to be our focus. That has to be the overriding frame. That has to be what we point to all the time. And there's some, um, there's some research that says that's the right way to go. So I'm gonna share that with you. Um, and, but I also wanna say what we're up against in the political realm. And some of you may have seen this New Yorker cover. If you can't see it from a distance, it's a stockade with um, public health uh, victims in the center. I think uh, the left, the center one says salt. I think that must be Michael Jacobson in there. I'm not sure. Okay, so we're in public, from a public health point of view, we are um, up against telling people not that they get to have happiness, but what they don't get to have. So that puts us in a, a much different position than those people who have the easy job of selling sugar, even though they do it very well. Much easier job. So, and the most recent attacks, as you know, have been loudly proclaiming that um, we are the nanny state. This was the full page ad that the Center for Consumer Freedom ran after uh, New York did its fabulous job and set the national agenda and the national conversation talking about portion size. And so we can't shy away from this. The, when people ask about message or people ask about what can we say, they often say, what can we say? And you give them something to say and they say, oh, but then people will say nanny state. That's right. That's what they're gonna say next. And I was so happy to hear Veva yesterday make her comment, wave, wave at everybody, Veva. She made her comment about, of course we have a nanny. Right now it's a corporate nanny that's telling us that we can drink all the soda we want and that's not the right nanny to have at all. In any case, we can't be afraid of the nanny state and I think you'll recognize our fearless leader here, Jim Krieger, with the sugar cube yesterday. All right, so the question is not what can we say that won't make people say who disagree with us nanny state the question is what are we going to say next what are we going to say next and you know when i was listening to the people who inspired me to during these during this conference it was mayor nutter and and congresswoman deloro and what did they say they said very simple things they said it's our job they said, it's the right thing to do. We're in a situation now where government has never been more demonized, and it is up to us to say, yes, indeed, there is a role for government. It is the right role, and this is what we have to do next. So how do, how do we do that? And since we know the starting point is going to generate that nanny state um, argument, it, it's important to know what people have been studying because we are sort of grasping for things. What can we say? And I love um, some of the work that's coming out of Cornell, not just on the um, soup that will never end. That's good studies too. But Jeff Niederdeep's work has been very interesting to me. He's done some investigations of what moves people. And it's not, when we say move people, we don't have to move everybody. You know, in the campaign messaging work group that we had earlier, a lot of those campaigns coming from health departments, telling people what to drink, what not to drink, that sort of thing, 
they do have a mandate to reach everybody in a jurisdiction. But when we are in a policy battle, when we're in a political battle, what we need to do is reach those people who agree with us and help them raise their voices and help them understand that they are not alone. And that's extremely important. We have to make noise. We also have to understand the starting point. And Jeff's research says that most people believe obesity is caused by lack of willpower, and that gets reinforced over and over and over over again. So that's our starting point. That's not something necessarily we're going to change, but it's important to know a couple of other things that he found. One is that opinion is movable. It's not, we're not so polarized, even though it seems like we are. What he found is that there can be motion uh, across the political spectrum. That's good news for us. And the other thing he found is that the beliefs about food marketing and the causal role that it plays in what people eat are correlated with support for tax policy in particular. We need to move and make louder the people who understand what the problem is and agree. And so that means we have to start talking about marketing more often in the way that Jean described and point to it as, a, as the culprit that it is. And that's going to help us make the case for the policies that we are advocating for. So, how did they do that in tobacco, people often want to know. And it was very simple. There, later on in tobacco control, in the, when I say later on, I mean like in the, in the late 90s, there started to be the kind of polling and research where people dice, dissected messages. But in the late 80s, it was a different story. Nobody was doing polling. What people were doing were advocating and experimenting and following leaders who made the case. And in the late 80s, what people realized and really codified was that they made a switch from talking about smokers and smoking to talking about the tobacco industry and the role of government. This was true no matter whether the policy was tax policy, clean indoor air policy, getting vending machines out of schools, what, or tobacco vending machines weren't in schools, but even getting rid of vending machines, all kinds of policies. And so there were specific messages for each of them, of course, but the meta frame, if you will, was this simple. It was moving from the individual to the environment, from the players in those environments that dictated what everyone's behavior was likely to be. We can do this same thing. We can start talking about the industry, its behavior, that behavior that we want to change and what that environment looks like. And, and I think we're starting to do that, and so that also makes me hopeful. I think that we have to do it louder, though. This is a letter, it's hard to read here, um, and I can't even read it from there. I'm sorry, I don't have it with, with me, but I'll tell you what it says. This is a letter that was sent to the Federal Trade Commission. Some of you know about the work that we've been doing um, and I, um, with the food marketing work group, Margo would be, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the food marketing work group, that a coalition that we co-convene and we have been working very hard to get some guidelines, um, the congresswoman talked about it this morning, voluntary guidelines about what food should be marketed to kids. We were able to generate thousands of comments to the FTC. The, the FTC, when the comment period was over, told us that they had received 29,000 comments and that 28,000 of them supported those agreements. That didn't seem to uh, hold weight against the millions of dollars of lobbying. One of the things I did was I trolled through those comments. I wanted to see what did the industry say and how were they characterizing their arguments. And I just trolled through them and I just downloaded all the industry comments that I could find. And then I saw this, a handwritten letter from a great grandmother, grandmother, and mother pleading for some help with food marketing. And her last line is, does anybody care? I hope you'll care. So real people need real help with this. You know, there's a theory in communications called the spiral of silence. And the idea of the spiral of silence is that people are reluctant to voice their opinion if they think they're the only ones who have it. So we have to voice that opinion. We have to point to the marketing. We have to be loud and we have to go through the news to do that. And that, you know, I, I'm, I'm wearing my message today. And, 
And the news, I'm going to skip a couple slides because because uh, Jim just told me I had to. The, um, I do think this is possible. Here's an here's, um, a article in Advertising Age and a quote from the advertising the head of the American Beverage Association, Susan Neely, saying that, yeah, they are in a tough spot right now. People are, um, there's a lot of obstacles that they have to face. And you, when you read the annual reports of the soda companies, they name obesity as one of those obstacles. So not only do we have to do the research, talk about the marketing and point to it, but we have to do it in a loud way. That's why I love what New York City just did. I keep looking at Lynn like she's still in New York. I, I love what New York City did. I think it's fine that there was a lot of outcry against it. We have to keep that noise level high, just like the Center for uh, California Center for Public Health Advocacy did. They got all sorts of headlines when they did a study about what people drink. And and they do this all the time. Yesterday, when we had the panel talking about the research we needed, one thing nobody said out loud is that that research needs to be in headlines. It needs to be in the news. We need to talk about it. When I looked at all that coverage that they got, and they're very good at it, I, one story caught my eye. The, um, the headline says, kids twice as likely as adults to drink soda. So that's, it was a very simple study they did with um, UCLA, published in a policy brief type format, got headlines all over the state because they paid attention to and made that a goal. And when I was reading this article, a picture caught my eye. It was this picture. It was a young child in front of a vending machine. It's almost godlike, isn't it, the way the light comes from the vending machine. But the thing about this picture is that it reminded me of this picture. And if we have moved from getting rid of that picture on the right, we can do the same thing with the picture on the left. We have to do it loud, vocally. We have to focus on the things that move people toward the policy, and marketing is gonna, pointing to the marketing is going to help us do that. So um, I will stop there. I think um, if you want more on framing, go to bmsg.org. And if you want to see the latest kinds of egregious ads that the soda companies are doing, you can go to digital ads. But even better, if everybody goes to kickthecan.info, I think we'll begin to have a collective voice and a collective conversation. So thank you. Hi, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This has been such a great conference and it's just so inspiring to see the growth and the concern and the activism around this issue that's taken place over the past decade. Actually, I guess I'm using this mic, right? Um, can you hear me? The one on the stand? Okay. Um, what I'm going to try and do is, is um, summarize some of the discussion that's happened here today in the context of our experiences in New York, trying to put a little bit of a conceptual framework about what we can do in a community. What are approaches to address the sugar-sweetened beverage problem in a community and what's working, what's tough, what's hard, what's easy? Um, nothing's really easy, but um, I'm calling it the P's. Uh, next, please. Oh, here. So I'm calling... There you go. This presentation, the peas, and I don't mean Pepsi. Um, some of them are the marketing classics, placement, pricing, and promotion of beverages that you've heard about here in a number of presentations. Some public health additions I would call portion size, which you've been hearing about, raising public awareness, and then the more political peas of the pushback that we're seeing, the bribery of dental groups and of other groups and so forth. And lastly, um, what we learned over many years with tobacco, the need to establish power and ability to play effectively in this field. So I'm just going to go through these very quickly and try and uh, give an idea of what some of our experiences were in New York and, and how we can think about this um, in more general terms. So the first thing we started trying to do was just to get sugary drinks out of as many places as possible. And I think in the first panel at the conference, you heard from a number of cities about their experiences, we started with our New York City daycare regulations in 2007, uh, which eliminated sugary drinks from daycare settings. We moved on to public food procurement and beverage vending standards in 2009, which also expanded the uh, requirements for schools. Um, in 2010 and 2011, we started reaching out into the community to try and get sugary drinks out of as many community organizations, hospitals, employers, and other settings and then um, trying to start campaigns around water and getting water in instead. Um, we had pushback about possible loss of revenue, pressure from vendors and workers, but these were relatively um, not too difficult. These were things we were actually able to do without too much, lots of work, but not so much political heat. 
Um, we um, then started doing very intensive community outreach um, over about a year and a half uh, to 326 community organizations and growing numbers of hospitals, um, employers, and so forth, um, and got successive pledges to try and eliminate sugary drinks from uh, as many places as possible. This also was relatively low controversy, um, but took a lot of legwork and time um, in terms of staff and people to be able to do this work. But we also felt like it was essential to, in the future, be able to implement policy proposals because there just wasn't the level of community understanding uh, that we needed for acceptance when we first started this work. Next, oh, sorry, press the button here. Um, the other area of placement which is absolutely essential is changing the retail environment, where this stuff is sold. Um, sugary drinks are absolutely ubiquitous and constantly pushed as a, at us, as was outlined by um, other speakers. We started work with bodegas, with corner stores that are very prevalent in New York. We had some success in getting them to place healthier beverages at eye level, um, but limited success in getting unhealthy stuff out. Um, we tried talking to supermarkets over the years. Uh, so far, it's been very difficult. Their space is contracted out in complex agreements. And I think the positive thing is that we have a national group that's studying this issue and starting uh, to try and figure out how to make progress. Um, so this is an area that we know is critical and we need to keep at, but it's been slow and difficult to make progress. Um, this is your typical corner store in, in a poor neighborhood in New York City, and as you can see, it has a very healthy product selection. Um, price, um, as I think Shari um, Shariki mentioned, is probably the highest potential impact group of interventions, but very heavy uh, political lift. So fortunately, Richmond, California has soda tax back on the ballot for November. New York State's two years attempts failed so far, although we hope um, that they will make progress in the future due to massive uh, counter lobbying by the industry. Uh, New York proposed the pilot uh, to exclude soda from the SNAP program. That also met huge political pushback, um, both from the industry and also unfortunately from hunger groups and um, was denied by the USDA, um, although I think the discussion um, continues. Uh, we've been able to make more progress in testing differential pricing strategies in settings like cafeterias and universities with the city university, um, and that is an area that can move forward. So price we know is key, um, but it's, it's a tough one that we'll have to continue to battle. Restricting promotion, as some of the speakers have spoken about, um, is one that perhaps when we are able to establish deceit or addictiveness, we may make more progress on getting past the First Amendment limits to restricting promotion. Where we have been able to make progress is in the school system in restricting promotion of sugary drinks and in public properties. Um, but the more general uh, limitation of promotion continues to be a, a big battle. The latest P, as was presented to you by Commissioner Farley yesterday, is portion size. Um, we think this is a tremendously, or I think this is a tremendously um, promising area uh, where the legal restrictions of uh, First Amendment, for example, uh, are not in effect. As uh, Dr. Farley mentioned, um, this restriction will be going to the Board of Health on Tuesday for considerations for the restaurant environment. Um, but I believe that, that this is something that we should be considering across the country. How can we reduce uh, the prevalence of large portions in different types of settings? Uh, this you saw yesterday. This uh, proposal actually did have, in our initial survey, fairly strong support from the population and especially from parents. Not massive, but uh, the majority. Um, and it'll go to the Board of Health, public comment and hearing, um, probably in about three months, there'll be a final decision on it, I would guess. Public awareness um, is another P, and I think we've had a huge amount of discussion on that theme. I won't go into it in detail. New York's had a growing process over about eight years um, from more grassroots to mass media campaigns trying to address that, but I think we still need these incredibly effective messages, the, the, the pink slime message, the message that captures the imagination of the American people, and that I think continues to be a real challenge for us. Um, I, won't, I won't go into more detail on the uh, campaigns. The pushback P has been massive and growing uh, with direct lobbying funds, but also um, with consumer, with front organizations like Consumer Freedom, New, York, uh, Freedom, New Yorkers Against Unfair Taxes, and others. Um, we've seen major campaigns to buy off not only the dentists, um, but 
grants to conference of mayors, associations of state legislators, um, I think counties, I'm not sure about that one, I'm pretty sure, um, but increasingly organizations of political importance in the nation are receiving grants from the soda industry. Um, and then all the way down to the grassroots of churches, community organizations have been um, getting grants uh, from Pepsi and Coke, often under the guise of, of fighting obesity, as was laid out. And this is uh, going to be increasingly difficult. As you can see, this was the main obstacle on passing soda taxes. And uh, this slide was already shown today. The attacks have gotten pretty personal. Um, so basically, in summary, the building the power to change is going to be a replay to some extent of the fighting big tobacco battles of public health. We will need to build the political will. Uh, as Senator, as uh, Congresswoman DeLauro pointed out, we need to strengthen our networking and coalition um, building ability. And I think today's meeting is really an example of making progress on that front, continuing to increase public awareness. People got mad about tobacco. We need to get them mad about soda. We need to get them angry that this is being done to them and that so many people are dying from diabetes. Uh, Barry Popkin and I were discussing diabetes is the first cause of death in Mexico now. People need to be mad about that. Um, it is not acceptable and, and anger is going to be necessary. We also need to mobilize the insurance and economic interests that are footing the bill for obesity and try and get them mobilized and involved uh, in this coalition building and, and to have the power to achieve change and confront the uh, powerful lobbies that we're dealing with. Just so that we don't leave this meeting pessimistic, um, we are seeing some progress. We're seeing progress in New York, and we're seeing progress in, um, in California as well, with decreases in sugary drink consumption over the last uh, six to seven years. We don't have the latest year's data, actually, from when the heavy campaigns have begun, and it'll be very interesting to see that uh, in California, drinking uh, sugary drinks also declined. So just summing up, I would say if you're in a community it's a combination of strategies. You want to pluck the low-hanging fruit that you can to do everything you can in terms of strategies that don't have as heavy a political lift and that uh, we can move forward on. And at the same time, you want to pick a wall to scale. We need to try and get movement in advance on these more difficult strategies. Um, we will eventually prevail and get them through, but it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of political activism. And I think as we're doing here today and yesterday, we need to work together ever more effectively um, through listservs, through strategies, through sharing resources, and through uh, developing political support to uh, be able to accomplish our goals. Um, so just thanks to all the New York City staff who've worked on all these issues and to so many fabulous colleagues around the country who've been also trying to address these issues. Thank you. Eight minutes. <laughs> what a wonderful set of presentations, and also great thanks for the speakers to keep their comments on time and on track. And so now we'll have actually a good chunk of time for discussion among the panelists, and then also with you in the audience. So I'm going to have a seat over here. If I could do this without falling off the stage. <laughs> So I think one of the themes that we've heard about from all of our speakers is the outsized resources and influence that industry has. And so I'd like to go ask our panelists, what do you think the most effective countermeasures to take, and what do we have to balance the cash and the political influence that industry has with what we can bring to the table to, to ultimately prevail in this battle? I'll start with, with Jean. That is a, it's, a, it's a very, it's a, that's a huge challenge, and uh, I, I'm very disheartened by uh, what happened in California with the dollar tax on cigarettes. That we're, you know, in March, 67 percent of the population supported that tax increase, but when just that was in March, and just when the vote came up just very recently, um, it, it was just over 50 percent that. You know, it was a very close thing, but it went from 67% supporting it, they, it was a huge drop, and the, and the tobacco industry spent $50 million, $50 million. And so that's what we're up against, of course, and, and increasingly with the Citizen United decision, we're going to just see more and more money just flowing in, it's going to make it harder and harder. The only thing we've got, I mean, it's huge, but it's our people, and that's why what we need to do is sort of all the things that the other panelists have talked about, 
motivate, mobilize people, get them angry. I totally agree with that, get them mad in the way they were about tobacco, but and appeal uh, to the positive sort of emotions that we have. Because, because the, the corporate money issue has actually never been worse. Any other panelists want to comment on that? Well, I think we have a couple other things as well. Yeah, can you make sure Laurie's mic is on? Jean's mic's on. No? Yeah. I think we have a couple other things, Jim. We have science, and we have, um, oh, I sort of hesitate to say it, but we have truth. <laughs> we have, <laughs> you know, we have, uh, uh, just like Mayor Nutter said, just like Congresswoman DeLauro said, it is the right thing to do. We have the other, th the other thing we have is, is the hurt and the harm that has been wrought on the communities that suffer the most from this and on the families that suffer the most from this. And that has been important in every public health battle, that that becomes real, that the statement that... Um, How many mics on there now? Hi. <laughs> why, don't I, why don't you have somebody else? <laughs> well, you're on a roll there. Do you want to okay. finish it? Well, I, I, just, I, think, I think we have a lot here, and we have each other just as, as Jean said, and, and that's, that's the only thing we've ever had. And, you know, it, sometimes it can be very disheartening, but sometimes you have to pull the, the lens way, way back. And, you know, I have this little theory working in my, um, in my own mind, I'm calling it pebbles in the water. So I'll tell you what I mean by pebbles in the water. It came from in June of, I think it was June of 2010, when New York passed a dollar sixty pack, uh, tax on a pack of cigarettes, but in the same breath, essentially, declined to pass a few pennies on soda in sort of the same moment. And what that said to me was that, you know, for almost 50 years, you know, first Surgeon General's report on smoking and lung cancer and smoking and health was in 1964, so it's been a long time. We've been throwing pebbles in the river of tobacco control, and now except lately in California, but pretty much around the country, we can just walk right across. Doesn't mean it doesn't take work, but we can walk right across. With soda, we're just now dropping pebbles in that water. And it's gonna take a while before they build up in such a way that we can have that kind of success. And I think it's important to recognize that because the failures matter, the attempts matter, and the opposition is, their loud voice, we, we have to counter it, but, but that helps us because we can then have a platform to say what we need to say as well. Yeah, I think we, we've seen, and many speakers have noted, that we are already having an impact. We have forced the industry into a defensive position. And I think the changing the discourse, changing the social norms around this is already making some great progress. And I think that's thanks to the work that many of you have done here in this room. But industry is now responding. And they are trying to look like they are taking action to preempt the need in people's minds for government action and more effective action. So I'd like to talk to both Jonathan and Lynn a little bit about how should we respond to the, to the voluntary action that the beverage industry in particular has, has started taking in terms of um, how it will affect our work. Um, should I should use the big mic. Oh. My, my mic's on? OK. Can people hear me? Um, yeah, I think you certainly don't want to knock it. You know, the fact that they're putting out good, you know, smaller bottles is a good thing, but I think we don't want to be promoting it either. Hello? You okay. Oh. They are still the bad guys. They are still pushing uh, these products in a way that's leading to death and disability. Um, so I, I think we can, um, accept those changes, we can, you know, if, if there's a smaller portion available, we can encourage people to do it. Um, we can talk to industry. I think it is important to have some dialogue with industry. What we should not do is accept their money under any circumstances, because um, they are using that as a way of getting out of taking action on what they have to take. Um, and I think we just need to continue to push forward um, wherever we can. So one thing, I think we learned in New York City also was, you know, we took out a couple of battles that we didn't have the ability to resolve to the end. 
like asking USDA to, to take um, sugar drinks off of SNAP. And we lost that one, although I think the polemic in itself was helpful. But also figuring out what can I do in my city, what can I do in my state, what I, can I do in my hospital, what can I do um, in my church, uh, is very important because as we make those changes in as many community locations as possible, we will lead to changing social norms around this issue, I think. Um, Great. I slipped into another question. Yeah, that's okay. Talk. Well, I, I think, um, oh boy. <laughs> I've been involved in tobacco control issues as much as nutrition issues on, in legislatures. And when I think about voluntary actions of the soda industry, I think about what if we had actually just relied on voluntary action by the tobacco industry to self-regulate. Uh, and obviously we would be in a whole lot of trouble uh, from a public health perspective if that was the case. And so we have to look at it in that context, I believe, that we really shouldn't uh, be patting anybody on the back in the soda industry for any of the activities, even though I am happy about smaller uh, volume containers, uh, the pressure should always be constant and, and never ending until we actually see uh, changes as we've seen with tobacco over the years. Because if we, if we had stopped or paused in the efforts against tobacco, they would have slipped in and, and, and succeeded. Uh, and so these, we should never uh, put, let our guard down and, and praise the soda industry for, for things they've done, even though some may wish to do so. Great. Well, I wanted, we have about um, 14 minutes left, so I'm going to um, actually turn it over to the audience here, the rest of us who are attending the conference, to begin engaging in the same dialogue. And really, the question is, we've had this day and a half to sort of think through great ideas, to get a sense of the state of the movement where it is right now. And the question is, what are the next steps forward? What are you going to do when you go home? What do you think we should do in a collective, coordinated way together? Where, 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 what, is, what should we set as our goals and objectives for the next couple of years as we move this work forward? Um, we've heard that one of the most powerful things that we have to go up against industry is ourselves, our networks, our coordination, our ability to connect with communities and organizations who have the ability to spread our message, multiply our voices many fold. So I'd urge you all, let me ask a question. How many of you um, are on the Sugar Sweetened Beverage listserv that's sponsored by CSPI? Okay, so not everybody. So one easy thing everybody can do who's here today is go to the CSPI, send them an email, and say you'd like to sign up for the SSB listserv. And that way you'll be able to stay in touch with this ongoing, continuing dialogue and learn what others are doing, but also share your successes or your failures, because all of us learn from those, and we can build on that work together. The second place to go to is Kick the Can. As you've seen some cards about that and heard that today. That is the central clearinghouse right now for resources and doing this work. And so I would, I, what I do is I try to check it at least once a month to see what's new and to, to keep up on what some of the latest materials are. But let me throw it open to folks, um, everybody now. What, what, what do you see as promising? What do you see as how we take on the industry challenge, how we continue to mobilize our communities? What, what are your thoughts about where we should be going with this work? And if you don't have any comments, I'm going to go back because we have much more to say with the, the panel here. <laughs> I knew this whole group wouldn't be quiet. Yeah, I know. I'm Alyssa Bassler from the Illinois Public Health Institute. So I know we're never not going to have as much money as industry, but I feel like we don't have any money. And so who <laughs> is funding this? I mean, I, I hear some groups are out there, they're able to do some polling. I know there was some funding for some s kinds of things through CPPW that's going away now. Um, wh what, f what foundations are out there? Are they funding local initiatives or only all you all at the national level? I mean, how, how do we get resources to start to work on this kind of stuff? The messaging, the outreach, the grassroots organizing, the, the talking, you know, the, the lobbying? Anybody want to take a crack at that or I can start? So I think, I think that we, that's an excellent question. And I think that the um, CPPW is ending. However, there's a new set of grants coming out through the Public Health and Prevention Fund. And that, those grants are critical to look to see how they can support the work we're doing in sugar sweetened beverages as well as in other obesity and tobacco control activities. And so 
There's a new round of CTG, for example, that just was announced last week, and it's very possible to build in sugar sweetened beverage work into that particular set of activities. Next week, there'll be two new sets of REACH grants. REACH is a CDC program to reduce ethnic and racial disparities in health, and that's a perfect vehicle to move the work forward. So I think we have to be aware of what these opportunities are. I think there are opportunities to shape and influence the foundations, and I think they need to hear from us that this is important work to do and that it needs to be supported. And then finally, I think that we need to continue to work our traditional community partners and allies, and we all roll up the sleeves and do this without getting paid for it as part of our regular day-to-day -day work or what we do in our spare time. And it takes commitment and passion, but I see a lot of that here, and I think that will help us continue to move the work forward. I would add some of the things we were able to do in New York City, we did with very little staff, um, particularly procurement guidelines, um, changes in daycare and other settings um, we did as part of our normal work activities with very little extra funding. Big TV media campaigns is another matter. Where the Koch lobbyists really earned their money recently was in Congress when they slapped a bunch of restrictions on the HHS appropriations bill so that people who receive funding from um, HHS now um, such as community transformation grants are not able to as directly work in favor of policy changes uh, as we were in the past where CPBW directly encouraged it, uh, for example. So there are uh, onerous restrictions actually that have been placed on, on recent HHS funding, but it still does allow us to do a significant amount of educational work and you can still do policy work so long as it's not the same people funded by the grant. And you can also continue to do all the institutional change work that we've talked about at hospitals, local government, and so on. That, so there are plenty of opportunities to continue, continue the work, both visibly and, and less visibly. Is there someone running around with the mic? Yeah, right. Okay. Is it on? Okay. Hi, I'm Stacia Clinton from Healthcare Without Harm. Um, so speaking to the funding piece and then also about the capacity piece, um, in working with hospitals, we have the opportunity to really leverage um, the momentum and the voice of the public health messengers we have with physicians, doctors, nurses, dietitians, those that are really sending this message um, around the link between sugar-sweetened beverages and health. So there's that piece. And then also we're looking at um, hospitals and, and physicians that are also recognizing how this relates to um, community health and uh, how insurance companies are now starting to pick up on how they can tap into obesity prevention and how sugar sweetened beverages are linking to this. So in some areas, um, insurance companies are now wanting to fund some um, initiatives around um, obesity prevention, particularly around um, food program work, and we found some success in being able to link that to healthy beverage work or program work around that. So that's been successful as well. I'd like to just add to Stacia's comment that there's a new set of opportunities emerging again through the Affordable Care Act in terms of hospital community benefit. And hospitals are now required to provide community benefit um, as a condition of their nonprofit status and also come up with a community health needs assessment and an implementation plan. So for example, in King County, we've been convening our hospitals and uh, they have, through this convening process, have identified obesity and diabetes as an area they want to coordinate on and we will be able to integrate support for sh local sugar sweetened beverage work, we hope, through both outreach to primary care um, practices in terms of detailing type work, but also in terms of getting them on board with institutional change and on terms of education of the public in general through their, using their resources. So again, looking creatively as to who has resources in your community and what levers can you pull can be helpful. See, I'm not calling if I think the, the wandering mic is Marco, I know over there has some, there's someone over there. We've got lots of interest. Uh, well, I have a mic, yeah. so should I talk? Hi, no, yeah. this is Ann. Uh, so um, I, I don't have a good answer for the funding issue. Uh, you know, I, 
I think a lot of us in the room, or some of us have been very fortunate to have had these CDC grants, and, uh, but I don't, I don't think we can have a strategy that relies on that because there aren't very many and there are now all these political constraints and, and it's not a national um, template. I mean, it's a great way to get some cutting edge uh, um, work um, getting going and, and testing it. But, but the two areas that, that I think just <coughs> off the top of my head that if we could figure out funding, yeah, um, hospitals and youth groups. So, I mean, Stacia kind of spoke to the hospital issue, but you know, every community has a hospital. So if there could be a national framework advocate uh, uh, organization that, you know, could really take that on, I, I think that becomes a presence that is national. And then I think if you look to the tobacco model about youth and, and the great both um, work we've seen over the past two days of, of, of some youth and then um, several people have spoken to, to youth as real leaders. You, you know, um, I don't know if it's national or just in Massachusetts, but they, they call them the 84 groups for tobacco, which, um, uh, and, and if we could have like a national branding of, of youth groups and some money that could get out there, again, that provides a, a lot of creativity and momentum in the community that, uh, that, that can network nationally. I'm Margo Wu-Tan with the Center for Science and the Public Interest. I wanted to talk about one other way that we can work together and next steps in addition to being connected through the listserv and the website, and that's through some existing coalitions. So we manage two coalitions that do a lot of work on sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, one is the National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity, and there are about 300 national, state, and local organizations that are working together uh, and it's a good way of linking national, state, and local groups to work together and create synergy. And then also we have working groups that are working on a wide range of issues, school foods, menu labeling, um, healthy food on public property. And then the other coalition, which kind of overlaps on some issue, is one that Lori mentioned that she and I co-coordinate, which is the Food Marketing Work Group, which works on food marketing to kids. and it, it focuses on a number of dis different issues like putting pressure on the industry to change their practices, including soft drink companies, especially soft drink companies, healthier food for um, at restaurants, especially for children's meals. And so there are some places where we're working together and then trying to connect with some of the other coalitions, like we try to stay closely connected to the NATO Big Cities Project and other coalitions that are convening together. So if you don't belong to either or both of those coalitions and are interested in connecting with others, um, get in touch with us and we can hook you up. On. Okay. Hi, I'm Nancy Becker, a registered dietitian from Oregon Public Health Institute. And I'd like to put in a plug-in for the political process. One of the reasons why New York has been so successful is because you have a mayor that likes our issues. And we all have representatives in Congress, we all have mayors, we all have county officials. We need to work them hard. Talk to them about sugar-sweetened beverages, talk to them about obesity, and hold them accountable for the decisions that they make. These are the decision makers in most of the arenas in our lives, and we absolutely have to keep, keep our issue center, up front and center in, in, uh, in their perception of what voters care about. I'd like to add one more comment to that, which is, the notion of focusing that political capital. So we, we can see what can happen in a city like New York. New York now needs our support, for example, in that we believe that the portion size control policy is an important step forward. We need to figure out what are the most likely cities that might, for example, push forward a, t a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages and bring our collective resources behind to support folks. We need to look at cities that might make more sweeping changes in their school systems and figure out, are there places that are ripe for change that somehow by focusing our resources as a movement, we can break the ground and then others can follow more easily. So this model of trendsetters and of places where 
makes the first move has been enormously helpful, I think, in then disseminating and spreading the movement as well. So that could be another potential way to, to marshal our resources in a more concentrated, focused way. Jim, I'm Stephan Harvey from the California Center for Public Health Advocacy. And I said to Harold Goldstein, my colleague, um, picking up on your point, Jim, I'm going to say to the Californians who are here and the rest of you, um, the Californians, to go home in the next couple of weeks and think seriously about which cities or counties could begin a discussion picking up on what New York City has done. What we found in California with menu labeling was a discussion about menu labeling caused all sorts of positive waves. So in a spirit of friendly competition, mm -hmm. I'm going to urge Californians to compete with New Yorkers. Yes. And I would suggest that we all go home and just imagine if in the next month, even one additional city, regardless of its size, publicly said what Mayor Bloomberg has done is very innovative, and we're going to consider it as well. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm Megan Yarbrough, and I work at Rescue Social Change Group, and I work with a group of youth in Virginia um, with their statewide youth empowerment movement um, on obesity prevention and tobacco control. And I just wanted to add to an earlier comment about groups like um, 84 in Massachusetts. Uh, there are groups like that all over the country that were set up to work on tobacco control. Um, and these are groups of youth that really understand advocacy. They really understand the political process. Um, and a lot of them in the last few years have started to branch into obesity prevention. So if you're looking you know, to bring youth into the work that you're doing, I would definitely look to those groups. Um, the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids has their Kick Butt Stay website, and it has a list of all of the current groups, uh, the youth groups around the country. So you can look and see if the one in your state is either working on obesity prevention or is interested in sort of getting involved. Great, I think we have time for one last question oh, can, or can comment. I, well, I'm gonna be that person. <laughs> I think it's on? Okay. Um, hi there, I'm Nan Filer from Philly. I wanted to thank you, and I forget your name already, the dentist who spoke, um, in particular because I thought what you said was really, really um, new information in a really important way. Um, dental care certainly for adults is in many ways a marker of poverty, I think, or the lack thereof. So, um, and I guess I'd like to end by um, asking you about how to engage dentists because we're talking about coalitions, here you are. And I remember even as a kid in the 50s, you know, sugar was bad for your teeth. So it seems to me we really need to engage um, with the dental profession and wondering if you have any suggestions. Well, that hasn't changed. Sugar is still bad for your teeth. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's uh, it, the evolution of how oral health policy has, has uh, occurred over the last decade makes it very difficult to um, to talk about oral health outside of access to care. Uh, and the troubling reality is that the only effective way to not have tooth decay is to not eat a lot of sugar and to brush your teeth twice a day. There's no secret. Um, to get that engagement, um, I, I mean, I, there's a lot of interest uh, within the dental community. The American Dental Association is working on uh, nutrition guidelines. And I, I can actually say proudly that uh, the American Dental Association is going to be rolling out a consumer website uh, in the next couple of months, and they made it a point that in their guidelines for advertisers, there is no uh, sugar-sweetened beverages that will be allowed to be advertised on the ADA's website, so, um, which is nice. Um, I can't say, so the, it's a very different organization than the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. The American Dental Association is on the right pathway. Um, the challenge right now is that there's so much noise and distraction being put out there about access to care for children, um, which is very emotional. It's an, a very emotional battle, discussion. Um, it, it is very, mis there's a lot of misleading information and people just don't understand the, path, the, the steps to good oral health. Um, fillings don't give you, having filled cavities makes you still unhealthy. Um, but the perception out there is that it all of a sudden makes you, you, you new again. Um, 
And so I think the challenges for folks involved in public policy is going to be striking that balance when you talk about oral health. Um, because you do have one chance with oral health because you have baby teeth and then you have adult teeth. If you can avoid decay in your baby teeth, you, you most likely will have good oral health for the rest of your life. Um, but once you have decay in your adult teeth, there's really not much we can do to turn back the clock uh, and look back. Uh, and and the, obviously the most important steps are what the most important steps are for obesity, the earliest years. If you have good oral health in the first year or two of your life, you'll likely be healthy, have good oral health from then on air. And obesity is the same thing. If you're, if you're not obese early on, you have a much better chance of not being obese uh, when, you're, when you're older. Um, so f finding that common ground and trying to get folks to stop talking about access to care and talking about preventing disease from, from the onset um, is your best way to collaborate um, with oral health experts. But it's, it's going to be a matter of finding those individuals who can think more progressively and more properly about how to effectively promote good oral health. Okay, thanks. Well, I want to thank the panel and the rest of us for a great conversation and a great meeting. And we're going to turn it over to Mike next. <laughs>